Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Abby Solomon. I'm the program manager of Cultivator. So we are a, or we're working towards having an innovation center and a support organization here in Randolph, also a community workspace. Um, so as we are working on getting the location, we're putting on some of these um, kind of business support events. Uh, so that is what we're doing today. Um, so join us, we have Sue Shellback. she, and I'm probably, did I? She, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, she's an artist, she also worked at um, Wild Apple, the, which is a um, business that connects artists with commercial producers, and you can explain that better than me. <laughs> um, Amy Cunningham um, the, from the Vermont Arts Council, uh, Jess Wilkerson from White River Craft Center, and Chloe Powell from Chandler. And then we have Mark uh, Rosaldo, who's our town, um, town of Randolph Economic Development Director, and he's also a local artist. And he's going to guide our conversation today. And um, we're going to have a lot of time to talk and address questions from you guys, too. So go ahead, Mark. <laughs> well, um, yeah. And I'm, I'm here, too. I do a lot of business advising, and I'm more of a technical side of things. So. My role here today too. Well, Abby is a great source for finding out how to get money. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have so we have several. <laughs> we have a few people here tonight that that'll uh, that'll broach that subject. But the um, it's actually fun to have a small group because you know, we're free to ask questions. I think as artists, we're filled with lots of empathy, but it's also hard sometimes to talk in a large group. Um, so it might be nice for us. Nice for us if. Maybe each of you could spend just 30 seconds and say who you are, and so we can all know each other uh, before we get started. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. We could start with you. Okay. Hi, I'm Sage Kohavi. Um, I live here in Randolph. Uh, I'm an artist. Um, I had my own business from about 1996 through 2020, making jewelry, making sculpture teaching, uh, jewelry making, uh, makerspace, actually several makerspaces over the years. Um, and I guess since I moved to Randolph, I haven't been too active, and I certainly don't see myself going back into making jewelry full-time professionally. Um, but I wanted to kind of see what was available. If, if I went back to hobby status, which is like where my heart is really. Mm -hmm. um, and also just unofficially, Abby knows me because I work at the Vermont Law School in the Small Business Clinic. Oh, nice. Um, so we, we help business, small businesses with their legal needs. Um, so if you're, if, I don't want to put that, that's not really here now. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not representing tonight, but if anyone's interested, they can talk to me about that at any point. And we're having a workshop in Vermont Law at the end of this month, um, so we've been doing a series. So welcome, we're, uh, my name is Mark. Uh, we're just sort of going around and doing a brief introduction of, of ourselves. And uh, Okay, I'm Joan Walton. I'm an oral painter. I've been in Vermont about 10 years. I'm uh, from California and lived in Colorado. So a lot of my contacts and sales and teaching is out in California or Colorado. But I do teach here at Ava. And, um, Exhibit, I have an exhibit up at the Norwood Library. Um, oil paintings, this is. No, oh, what did I do with my card? <laughs> so, that's my work. And then, I'm in the um, artistry exhibit too, the mud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's it. I mean, <laughs> I, I painted uh, probably longer than anybody here. <laughs> it's over 50 years I've been in business. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Cornick. I'm relatively new to Vermont and to Randolph. I've been here about six months. I'm an abstract artist and a retired attorney from New York. Uh, I'm a White River Craft Center studio artist. Um, and I work primarily with all of my work is abstraction, but I work with found objects and uh, 
paints, all, all medium. Um, and I don't know what else to say about myself. Oh, I, I just curated a show at uh, 15 North Main Gallery uh, in honor of Women's uh, History Month and International Women's Day with nine other female artists from Grand Pop. So you should check it out. And nice to be here. And you have a piece on there. Oh, I see. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She's so prolific. She doesn't know where she has to uh, I am Davis McGraw, uh, and I am here with Mara. I'm not mad at visual artist. Yeah, my name is Mara Ritchie. Uh, I was invited by Sue. Um, the, uh, I work at Wild Apple, which is an art licensing agency, and uh, we used to be colleagues. And um, I've never explored the freelance world or anything like that, but um, I feel like, you know, my nine to five is, Sarah also uh, worked at Wild Apple, my nine to five is like the art, um, the art industry, but as an individual artist, I've never really explored like selling my own work or doing gallery work. I'm Sarah Adams, I live in Stratford, and uh, I used to work as a designer and artist at Wild Apple, and now I do licensed art for Wild Apple, and um, so freelance to design and artwork for um, some other companies that sell So I'd like to figure out how to do with freelance art and design get myself out there because I'm Kind of a hermit and don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Katrina Wagner. I own Graphic Beans, which is a website design company. Um, and on the side, I do some needle felting work. So that's kind of the hobby side thing that I do. And yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, I'm Robin Palmer. I'm just a citizen. I saw a post and it sounded interesting. I dabble in a few things, but I'm not trying to start an art business because that would seem like an interesting discussion if that's okay. To yeah, of course. Of course. Yes. Well. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Tyler, you want to? We're just doing a 30 second intro mm -hmm. of what you're. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah Tyler Gately. Um, I'd love to be a full time artist, but I'm not today. I have another job as a marketer, actually. Um, but I uh, love the paint. On the side, mostly aviation is my muse. So. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you guys. And I'm Courtney Gailey. I'm his wife. I'm here for moral support. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So we have two two supportive partners here. <laughs> that's uh, that's wonderful. So uh, I'll just say briefly. I, uh, I I studied performing arts in college. I went to uh, I grew up in Maine, a very poor uh, neighborhood. Um, I went to, we ended up moving and went to high school in a busier place. As soon as I graduated, well, when I was in high school, I started performing and uh, I got the lead in Fiddler on the Roof. So I got to play Tevye, and so I was hooked on <laughs> acting. And uh, so I moved out to California and uh, I auditioned for the American Academy of Dramatic Arts out in LA and I got accepted. So I went through their program and you guys can come on right in, actually. We can spread up for you. Yeah. 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 Ye
kind of became a trainer for 20 years on Wall Street and, it, and raised a family. And it wasn't until uh, we moved up here after 9-11, it wasn't until the, the pandemic when like my, all my creative muscles had semi-atrophied, I started, I started painting in the basement. And like, next thing I know, it all came out. And it was so beautiful. And I started painting like every single day and I ended up painting hundreds of paintings and I convinced some people to, to show my work and I started sending it to, to reviews and like, I just, I just fell in love with it again. I, I, I got connected to myself. I was able to sort of remind myself the joy of what art does for, for us. It, 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 centered, it centered me, it uh, made me a better father, a better husband. Um, so, uh, and I was, I was working for, I was a senior advisor for, for, a, for a large firm up here and I ended up leaving and joining the town uh, as economic development director because it was mission driven work. It sort of, it sort of was a, the next phase of my life that I wanted to go in that made more sense because different things mattered for me. And so, uh, and so that's kind of, uh, that's my story. And uh, we had, oh, there's other stuff, but I think that's, um, so the, the well, let's, let, let's let these folks come in and sit down. Hi. Come on, come on in. To, to a brand of well-known artists. Yourself. I'm Sherry Landy. I live here in Randolph. What kind of information were you looking Just for? Just your 30 second spiel. <laughs> are. Um, I am an artist in my free time, not professionally. I work um, as an art teacher professionally. Um, and I like to use a wide variety of materials because I'm bored easily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kirsten Quick. And I'm a sort of retired artist. Not retired from art, but retired. I'm trying to do art. And I'm uh, trying to make money off of it, which is extremely difficult if you're not really good at marketing yourself doing the photos and the emails and the, all the stuff. So that's why I'm here. Excellent. Did we miss somebody else? I stepped in, yes. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Laurie, and I'm reporting. This is Eddie. <laughs> Thanks for having her. Um, I was a graphic designer. I graduated with a degree in graphic design and fell into fine art and antiques uh, on the marketing end of things. Um, and from there, did jewelry. So I got an internship at the auction house as a jewel, working in the jewelry department. So I took those skills and kind of combined them and moved to Burlington, Vermont, and worked for an estate jeweler. Doing my photography got them established a long standing um, jeweler. I didn't have a digital presence, so I kind of mashed some skills together. Um, from there, actually, I worked with Sue, one of our speakers tonight, and uh, at, at Wild Apple. And I was working at an art publishing and licensing on the sales. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks. Well, all right. Well, this is a, a wonderful group. There's one more. Oh. <laughs> I'm Daisy Kev, and I do educational uh, native plant and pollinator. Awesome. So the, the we have a lot of artists in our community, and oftentimes, I well, oftentimes you see there's two types of artists that I've uh, that I've found here. We have the one that's so deeply involved in their work that they like they can't be bothered with this aspect of the business um, trying to figure out how to to market their work how to to create a uh, you know an artist statement how to create a website how to try to find a, a group of, of friends and supporters that will support their work it's just something that's too overwhelming to them because they're so focused on their work and sometimes they feel like well I'm signing out if I if I if I get involved in capitalism, it's a sellout. If I, you know, so there's this, there's this rift or divide between some artists and other artists in our community have figured out a way to, to do really well on social media. They've figured out a way to build a website. They've figured out a way to, to really tap into a social network and 
what what I find is, you know, someone like Tyler, for instance, does a really good job with his social network presence. He's got an Instagram account. He 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 shares fun stories about his work. He shares when he's look when he has different locations. But what I'm finding is, um, it's even though we have a thriving artistic community in Randolph, it it's always a question of what's how. Like it's almost not really viable, right? We've got a ton of businesses that that promote art, that sell art. We have five galleries in our town. So we've got a ton of work uh, that's being presented. Chandler is incredibly supportive of the artistic, the artist community. The gallery downstairs is bring, it's a huge draw, not just in, in Randolph, but we are really the epicenter of the cultural community in central Vermont. Um, but what I'd like to talk about now with the help of the panel members is like, what are some, what are some things that you have done that you've seen ways to help artists that are struggling and feel free to, to talk about your stories and some of the things that you might be looking for. Uh, yeah, thanks for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can start, though I'm not working in the arts um, regularly, but um, I, I come from CUNY Capital Vermont, which is a mission nonprofit uh, micro lender. Um, focused on businesses that can't get funding for many reasons. Um, not having collateral is the primary reason for that, or just needing something very small. So working with artists um, at that capacity, we, ha we had often um, inquiries from artists that needed, you know, $2,000 would get them through. They, they do a robust um, craft fairs in the summer, which cost a lot up front because of the investment to, um, to register, and but then they were making their money during the summer. So um, I think, and in the finance world, I know it's weird, I do, my mom is an artist. She was an art teacher forever and retired early and um, is a potter and does craft fairs and I grew up in them. Um, so I, I have that <laughs> knowledge, but, um, a lot of financial people don't understand how artists work and what they need to be able to be successful. So I think that that is something that, um, that can promote and help is just understanding how um, creatives operate their business and um, that, that it is a business. <laughs> That's the other piece that's very important. Could you repeat the name of your... Okay, so I'm rep I am representing now. I work with Cultivator, which is um, yeah, which is a, we're working towards innovation hub and community workspace here in town. I'm the program manager for that, but um, I worked for Community Capital of Vermont, and that that was the funder that I worked with. Yeah. Did you have a question? It's a kind of a build on. It's sort of like there's the reality of like when you're a potter for example you're probably building up your stock during certain parts of the year so you're in the red mm -hmm. and then you're selling your stock at other parts of the year and when communicating that to like the state organizations who are managing health care and other things like that they they want to know how much you make each month yeah. and i'm like well i'm several k in the red now through the middle of the year and then we'll start to go up yeah. So like, what do I do? I have healthcare for half a year, and then like a totally different program for the second half of the year. Like, I don't know how to. I mean, I give them my average, you know, mm -hmm. fake, an, an erroneous number for every month, <laughs> but it's the average and it's the best I got. But I don't know how. It's so tricky. I feel like with <laughs> our sector, um, there's a lot of similarities with um, the agriculture sector. That it's that it's that kind of ebb and flow, yeah. and you yep. know. The harvest comes, but you've yeah. got to put in the money before that. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a answer for you beyond averaging like you're doing is probably the right thing to do. But I just I think one of the things I wanted to mention was just the idea of, of the other sectors that we have similarities with and that we can learn from. And I think when I think about the work of creatives kind of making their way through and the slog of running that kind of business, I think a lot about farmers and that kind of similar. And I know a lot of farmers who are artists too, so it's a lot of similar. 
Yeah, we've had a few businesses in town that had to come up with creative ways to create sort of pro forma numbers into the future, what they might do to get a loan, for instance, uh, or to have a credit line to cover those down periods. And we found with a good story and some good references, it's been pretty helpful for, for several artists in the communities to get those loans. Um, or like, even if they don't need it in the moment, if things are doing good, but it's sort of, a, it's there in the background, it's something that can be done. That's, that's one option that we've seen has been somewhat helpful for some of our businesses. Yeah, when I was sending artistic businesses to our loan committees, would compare them to Maple, and mm -hmm. that would just somehow people totally understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you're pulling a yarn on <laughs> <laughs> The maple trees only do this at this certain time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. You're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <clears throat> Any other questions on this topic? Um, I have a question. Um, how, how, how have, who can comment or has any thoughts on making that shift from, from working full time to starting to let that go, uh, becoming an artist where you're starting to depend on that, building the confidence level to make that, that jump and ways in which some of you might have done that in the past um, and can share a little bit about that, that process. Maybe there was some fear associated with it. Maybe there was, you know, maybe you sort of made the jump and then you pulled back. Um, so I'd really love to, to hear some of those stories and maybe you could yeah, comment I, on that. I can speak to that for sure. Um, I, I've been on my own as working for myself for the last year. Um, I've been working for over 20 years um, in an art publishing company um, there were some changes in the company and I was laid off. I'll be transparent about that, which was shocking and, at first, but um, turned out to be a, a silver lining of sorts because I was ready to make a leap. I just didn't have the faith in myself to do it on my own. And um, the last year has been super instructive for me as far as um, testing my, my own abilities to believe in myself. And, um, and even to see you know, how I could structure a creative life um, and create a workplace for myself. Um, I think the, the first thing was, was having, like going from having colleagues that I talked to every day, um, and some of them are here, and I'm still very, I talk to them a lot of days anyway. Um, we still connect with each other, and they're still very much connected as friends. Um, but going from having no colleagues to having to, I mean, from having tons of colleagues to having no colleagues was, was a real shift. So I had to get out of the house and I, I went to South Horizon, which is near me, and hung out in the coffee shop there. And it's nice to meet you, Tyler. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler's promoted my work out of the first branch, which is wonderful. Um, I, I've been showing my work there even before I left Wild Apple. But um, I think like there's a, a Venn diagram you need to draw for yourself when you're thinking about going out on your own. It's like, what are your skills? Like, what are you good at? What are you passionate about? And where can you, where can you sell any of that? So, what are the crossovers of those three things? And you're often you find in that little crossover space that what you need to know in order to move forward. And in my case, I had, I, I was a painter and I am a painter, but I'm also a photographer. I also do branding and and design work as well. So I, I had a lot of pieces of things that I could do. And I found by diversifying things I could offer, uh, I've made a really nice little creative work for myself. And there's a lot of variety to it, which I really like. Um, there are some weeks where everybody I work for wants something from me. <laughs> and sometimes I find the thing that suffers is the painting, which because that's the thing I need to make myself do. And um, so that's where, that's a continued struggle. And uh, I wish I had the answer for that. Um, but, you know, when you have someone calling you and you need something by tomorrow and they're going to pay you, a nice idea, hourly rate, it's sort of, you, you do that first. So I, that's the thing I'm, I'm feeling like in this year two of this experiment, which I feel is really exciting and, and working out, um, I need to make more time for that, uh, that painting part. And I find when I have, the trust in myself when I do the work and when I make the leap and put it out there either on social media or on my website or elsewhere, I, I do tend to sell my work 
I, I just have to be brave enough to show it. <laughs> and sometimes that's for an introvert like me, it's not always easy. Um, so getting out of your comfort zone sometimes is, is the best thing you can do um, in order to, to make, make, get some exposure and, and also make some sales. And none of us want to, well, I mean, some people actually love selling their work, I think, but I know a few artist friends who are really great at it. I'm like, I wish I could channel them a little more. And so I've learned from them, just watching them. Um, if you have friends who are good at it, watch what they do and learn. Yeah. And I would say building on that, um, the one thing I was talking to Susan earlier about the panel, and I was like, oh, what are some key things that I think about? Um, so at the Craft Center, we have about 10 private studios, and we have, um, give or take, we have a few shared studios, um, and we have about 18 studio artists that are in our mix. Um, and we have a few other things going on, exhibition space, um, regular programming for different ages. Um, but with our studio community, I normally engage with people when they're ready to take a step to um, invest in themselves, invest in their artwork, their practice, and have that sanctioned space so that they can create, um, which is a really exciting thing to witness. Um, and so much of the excitement and the energy that they bring is not just about like the new chapter that they're about to embark on or really you know, further, sometimes they've had a home studio, um, but is also like the, eagerness to be part of a creative community. And I think everyone here that's in the room is taking a step forward to network and learn more and kind of build, um, build out your information about kind of what, how do you navigate this? Um, so one thing that I kept coming back to when I was thinking about the panel was very much just the significance of just networking. I hate the term networking, but it is so it's necessary. Community. Mm -hmm. yeah. community. Yes. I, I've also come from like a startup world and networking ugh, has a <laughs> connotation sometimes. But yeah, it is building community. And um, so much of what we're building at the craft center is very much that, is trying to embrace the creative community, both that's already contained within our walls, but then extend beyond that. Um, because this is a, it's a very challenging thing to navigate. Um, and it is, like you're saying, is so diverse. Like, uh, the definition of a professional artist varies for every artist, depending on what your medium is, what your interest is. Like, do you want, I mean, the traditional mold that I think we think of a professional artist that eventually will be, like, on, you know, the walls of MoMA or the Met is, like, not the reality of life. You know, it's, it's how do you fulfill your, your own passions, your own desire, um, and make a living from it, or at least continue that fulfillment so you're able to have a creative um, engagement with the world. Um, so what you were saying, Sue, is very much what I've witnessed and kind of seen in my career and also at the Craft Center. People just, you know, taking jobs that are that pay bills, kind of touch on that creative sense, but also like remain firm in their commitment to themselves and their practice, mm -hmm. um, and kind of look, lean into their community, to their network, to seeing how they can expand that, to build out the skills and understanding of what else is needed to further themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, like realizing that you are a business, like if you do want to move more squarely into a sense of being, um, being a, an artist who's able to just create and sell, um, like original works, for example, like really, I mean, in any sense, really, um, just kind of equipping yourself with knowledge of what it is to run a small business, like learning how to market or learning people that know how or meeting people that know how and being able to just identify like the the many different buckets that you need to fill in order to have a well-rounded approach um, is is daunting. But again, if you have conversations and like share that excitement and energy and interest with others, things kind of snowball and and go from there. So, yeah. yeah and there are so many great tools available to us mm -hmm. now. It's, I mean, we do kind of need to know how to take a good photograph, mm -hmm. but there's there are tools available that make that help us enhance our photographs mm -hmm. that we're taking if, if we're not a professional photographer. There are sites that help us set up shops that can't
can make us pull our hair out, but mm -hmm. can also, <laughs> they have a lot of help desks that they can, you can do it. I mean, it's yeah. kind of amazing. And if you can't do it, there are people all over the state that are ready to help you do it. Um, this, this goes back to building a community uh, mm -hmm. of support. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes a village to support artists. Mm -hmm. And the, the more vulnerable you are within that village, the, the more authentic you'll, you are. And the more willing people are to support you, the artists that that I see that come on, that share their ups and downs, they share the days when they feel like a complete fraud, when they sh share the days of feeling, you know, that little voice inside their head just constantly holding them back, talking to their community about those anxieties and stuff has really been helpful. And those are the ones that are actually making it through those levels of resistance, those creative U-turns that prevent you from taking the risk of, 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 putting a, of putting a submission in, you know, setting yourself up for rejection, which is such a big component of being an artist when you start putting yourself out there, learning how to accept that constant, you know, we like your work, but we're not gonna use it in this experience, or you know, when, when you apply for a grant, it can be such a, uh, we prostrate ourselves on the floor for hours to, to submit for a grant for $500. And you know it can be so unnerving when you get a rejection from that. You know, but you have to do it. It's part of the process, and you know, you you keep going out there and doing it. So the commentary on having a community that can support you is, I, mean, I think it's you know it's also that balance between understanding what social media is and what it isn't, and do we do we, do you get the type of satisfaction having. Uh, communication with people on social media that you get when you're actually live in a community with people. And so it's, it's a different type of satisfaction. You need it, right? It's a necessary evil to be on social media and to show your work, but it can also, it can also have, uh, I don't know how you guys have experienced that, but it can have some kind of negative implications, right? You can kind of feel crummy. You put something out there and you're just like, oh man, you know, are people gonna like it or are they gonna comment on it? I mean, how, how have you guys done with social media and has, has it been helpful? Does anyone care to share their story? I'll say that as a consumer of social media, that following artists on Instagram, in my opinion, is the highest and best use of social media. I've, I'm done with Facebook, but like it's been so illuminating for me to follow artists I know and who are in the state and also just find people all over the world and see like that as a consumer of social media, seeing that insight into someone's creative practice and in the studio, I think it's like awesome and like eye-opening and um, despite the rest of the dumpster fire that social media can be, I really get a lot of joy out of that. So thank you for artists who are putting yourselves out there on Instagram. And it's, always, it's, it's, it's a way to actually get people to look on other things that offer further deeper information about who you are. They, they check you out, they go online, they go to Google, they see your name, if you have a website, they go to your website. Next thing you know, you've actually built, at least in theory, hopefully, a real, uh, you're starting to build a real relationship with a potential buyer or somebody that just, you know, you've, you've spoken to a, a, another person about your work and I found that's been helpful with, yeah. with posts that I do when someone goes to my website and then sends me a link or a note on my website or joins my newsletter. I'm like, okay, I can keep doing this. That's it that can be open studio without the pain of having to actually do an open yeah. studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, open studio is great. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just saying that I find it as somebody who's not really adept at posting on Instagram, although I have done it, and I'm not very good at taking the photographs, but I try to do it. I find it, it's like the world of artists showing their work and it's like thousands of people competing for the same attention. And I feel like, what is the point of me struggling doing this? Because, you know, like no one goes to my Squarespace website. I don't even know how to update it. Or obviously I need to tap some resources, but at the same time, it just seems like there's thousands and thousands and thousands of artists there. And who gets the attentions are the ones that spend every day on Instagram and post every day. And I just am not interested in doing that. It's just not what my attention really yeah. wants to do. 
So it's like, what's the point of using it? I have a question. How many people have email lists, like an email following, like send out a newsletter or a quarterly or a weekly? Do you find those are successful? That's something I haven't done yet, but. Yeah, I follow. So for anybody that is on Instagram, uh, there's a great person who's a artist specific consultant. Her name is Tiny Buffalo Consulting. I get no endorsements. I don't pay for her services, but I follow her and engage with her. Um, and she gives some great advice and great stats. And as a professional marketer outside the artist uh, world, is email is still like the preferred way, even for every generation you can yeah. think of, from our kids to them above because um, it's right to your inbox and you can tailor it. You know, now these things are so advanced with, I know kind of an icky word, AI, but um, you can tailor it. So you send me one that says, hi, Tyler. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay. You know, they, got, they know my name. So I'm kind of curious. I do like their stuff, what they got. I have a studio sale going on. Um, so there are stats out there and she's a good one to follow because she just puts it right in your Instagram feed. Um, but it's still a preferred way. It's the most trusted way to communicate because it's still coming to your inbox with your name where so much of social media and I'm, I'm pro social media for selling anything, especially art. Um, but, uh, it's still a little impersonal, right? I can't talk to all my followers and the few I have, Hey, you, Hey, you, Hey, you, this is for you. It's just, can they relate to it as they're scrolling through an email, uh, is still the most personal connection you can make. So, um, it's painful to grow an email list, frankly, um, and it's a slog. I mean, it's not, it doesn't take a lot of effort, but um, there's easy ways to create what's a landing page. So when someone goes to your Instagram profile, says, hey, sign up for 20% off. They can go to this page, put their name in, boom, you got their email now. So uh, there's a ton of resources out there for stuff like that. And, and you know, I'm happy to show anybody how to do that. Some are free, some are not free, but not expensive. Um, so it is a great way to, to, to find people and, and to get them in the loop. And if someone signs up, like all of you guys, you probably don't sign up for emails you don't want. You know, you're, you're signing up for either a discount or you're really interested in the product. So how do you, how do you navigate around firewalls? Like even when I found, even when I put someone on my, on my email list, sometimes I, I have to, I don't, they don't open it. And I know they would open it because they, they, we had a great conversation, but yet there's a firewall. How do you get around that? Yeah, I mean, email generally are becoming more and more sophisticated, you know, and blocking what you don't want to see. Um, so ideally, you know, you're telling people, hey, keep an eye out, look out for spam. Um, don't send things that, there's all these rules. Um, you can Google these, like what not to do when you email, that email's already built around. If you put certain characters in the subject line, if you use certain words that seem too gimmicky, or too salesy, those might get pushed to like somebody's promotion folder or spam folder. Um, so you're going to have some of that, and that's the importance of building up a pretty good. So list. once they've opened your email, once though, is it? Are you, do you now have an open communication to send quarterly, and they'll it'll I'll, I'll, it'll go to their regular email box? Yeah, that's the best case scenario. So the vast majority are going to if you send a proper email, uh, the vast majority are going to make it to their inbox. Um, if it doesn't for some reason and they open in their promotion folders and they open it, then it's likely going to go to their inbox. It really depends on your, what email, Gmail or Apple mail, Yahoo, what those settings are. But those are the good news for us is that those are becoming more sophisticated and blocking out the stuff we don't want. So you just got to make sure that your emails, you know, and again, that's going to be send out thousands of emails at, at my regular job. And, you know, we know the, the, some percentage isn't going to yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a numbers game, too. The more, the better, obviously. Are you sending it out of the newsletter, like through MailChimp, or? Yeah, through Squarespace. Yeah, because yeah. those will all, always go to a promotions folder, but if you send it as a real email, BCC, uh, if your list isn't so huge. Um, yep. That's, yeah. When I do emails outside of newsletters, I'll often BCC and write a more personal, hey, friends, like, can have friend, lots of friends and acquaintances that might be interested in the show. So does everyone um, understand what she's saying? That, that process is a helpful way to go. How many people can you get on a BCC? I don't, I, over a hundred. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. How, but, how, you want to be judicious about it because they'll, if you're doing a ton of it, then you get caught in a, yeah. you're more likely to get filtered. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, more, I would do more than a hundred. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can also 
ask for the recipient to add you to their contact list, mm -hmm. to their address list, and that will help keep you out of oh, good. Mm -hmm. the spam box. But it might not keep you out of the promotions tab, mm -hmm. the way Gmail, and yeah, Gmail I was the worst with the promotions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I've inherited the Chandler email from the previous 10 directors, so my promotions tab is very full <laughs> and some very important emails actually come in through there. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I come to this with more more recent experience supporting musicians in um, accessing grants and gigs. I've worked um, uh, putting together events and also working as an agent um, and just listening to everyone's conversation. I'm just thinking that no one is probably has the budget to have an agent, but I wonder if there's anyone that works like representing a whole bunch of artists as and helping them connect with the galleries and the people that. Um, is that a we, I, the work that Wild Apple did, um, and Laura can speak to it, she's working there still, but um, it, that was more for commercial, representing artists for commercial yeah. licensing. And I, it's a, I, I'm still a signed artist there, and I, I have passive income coming to me from, from work I'm doing. I'm doing it anyway, so I, I send it through Mora and say, do you want to have it? And I send digital files that I have to have this high resolution, um, good quality files. So as an artist, you kind of need to learn either scan or photograph your work in a good quality way if you want to do that. But it is a great way to have some income coming in that, you know, I, I make five to ten thousand dollars a year from royalty income for work I did five years ago sometimes, or three years ago, or two years ago. And um, so it's a nice, it's a nice model. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, because it's, you know, you're, you're making artwork that needs to work in a commercial world. And so what, what you might be wanting to paint and what works well in that commercial world might not match, or they might match perfectly. So um, there are all kinds of different agencies. Wild Apple is one of them. Um, there are quite a few in Vermont. There are many throughout the world. Um, you can just look up licensing agencies um, for artists uh, online, and you'll find all kinds of lists and all kinds of orders with all kinds of things. There's a research you need to do to decide what's a fit for you. But um, for me, it's certainly something I want to keep doing because it's a nice, it's a nice side income that I can kind of, kind of count on. But there's, you know, once at least quarterly, I'm going to be getting checks, and sometimes I get them monthly, um, depending on <coughs> the rotation of the company that I've had a license with. Um, so it's. Licensing for everything from um, your artwork onto prints and posters that are sold in all kinds of venues as prints, and then the rest was all the all the different home decor products that artwork goes on, everything from shower curtains to bedding to um, dishes, things for the table, uh, leggings, fabric, that kind of stuff. And then there's the putting your own work onto those types of things. There are sites all over. Um, Spoon Flower is one of them that you can put your own artwork onto your fabric yourself. Um, you can do it in such a way that you can have it sold from your store so people can order it and have it sent to them from Spoon Flower so you're not even in the middle of it. You don't have to buy it and have it on hand. There, there's ways to do that. There are also many sites um, in which you can have your artwork on products and sell it from your own store. Again, that place will fulfill it for you but you can sell your art onto mugs and t-shirts and tote bags and cards and all that kind of stuff. Um, there, there are a lot of ways that you as an artist can, can put your art on, onto products if you want to. There's a little research involved because not all of it's the quality you want. Mm -hmm. um, so there, it's a little bit of gambling some of the time. How, how do artists know if they're not necessarily here and back in their mm -hmm. first year uh, in terms of setting realistic expectations of what success looks like. You send emails out, you don't get a response. You set, you set up an account for something and you don't get a great deal of response. It's sort of like a business downtown when they open. I try to, I try to let everybody know, like, don't, don't have an expectation of making money in your first year. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you'll probably fail in the first nine months or something. And when they do fail, it's always, it's always upsetting to me. But I think with artists, because we're so vulnerable, we put so much on the line, 
Uh, and we put ourselves out there in so many different ways. How do you, how have you guys set, expect, you folks set expectations or um, to, to, to set a realistic uh, mindset for yourself for success when you're in, you have the downtimes and you're not selling anything? I'm not speaking from personal experience, but just picking, piggybacking on what Abby was saying around kind of empowering artists to embrace that role as being a small business person. Um, and what you were saying about kind of getting clear on what your own professional and personal goals are. I would say, you know, you don't have to call it a business plan if it makes you feel weird, but start with the plan, knowing, you know, like everyone has said, that your, your personal goals, your creative practice goals, your professional business goals are going to be different than everybody else's. So getting really clear on what, what the goals are and starting with that business plan, um, even if you don't call it a business plan. Um, I think that uh, there are so many resources available for the small business world. And, uh, and mm -hmm. I think you know, part of what we're trying to do with the Arts Council is making sure that arts organizations and artists know when things go out for small businesses, and this was so apparent during the pandemic, Small Business Administration was the one that rolled out PPP, right? They rolled out all of these waves of COVID relief and it took like a lot of communication, a lot of time to say, hey, that, that's you. Hey, nonprofit arts organization, that's you. Small Business Administration, they're here to help you. And, and the Vermont Small Business Development Center, the Center for Women in Enterprise, like there is, there are federal dollars that are in this state that are funding all manner of like wonderful resource organizations, including our Regional Economic Development Commissions, the Vermont Law School Small Business Development Center. Like, you belong in those places, I guess. It's kind of part of that kind of encouragement around uh, embracing and seeing yourself as a small business person. That's not a direct answer to your question. But no, but it's a yes. great answer. <laughs> and what's awesome about what we have in Randolph and what we're building is part of the new Randolph Innovation Hub is actually about helping uh, find ways to sit through, uh, sit through programs and classes about building uh, a business plan, about establishing realistic goals and expectations and actually guiding you through the entire process. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out and harass, I mean, bug, <laughs> uh, because this is exactly what the hub is about. And it's just in its infancy, but it's strong. It's funded. They're going to be here for a long time. You know, so you're, uh, you're really the very first people in our community that have access to these programs that haven't been in existence ever. And so Abby realizes the artistic uh, community that we have. Amy is speaking about how important it is to reach out and communicate with a community and build a network in, in conjunction with what you're doing socially. Um, everyone is speaking sort of a very similar tone. And what we're really excited to say is that the, the, we, we have some structure in place that's gonna be helpful for artists. We just have to make sure we get the word out. We have to make sure that we're able to connect the dots in terms of what resources are available for the community. And it's, it's sort of, we're sort of stumbling into this. Abby's working into this um, where the, 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 the innovation hubs that have been established regionally have been uh, primarily designed for technology companies. So they're realizing now in rural America, what technology is, is a little different or, or you know, that you know, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily entrepreneurs with a tech gadget or widget that we're gonna go take to market and go to a venture capital firm and, and fund it and all that. No, that's not what we're doing. It's different. And so there, Abby and her team, they've started to sort of reestablish what it means to be part of an innovation hub. And they're using terms like tech enabled. So what does that mean? Well, you build a website and you sell your, your art online. Well, that's a tech enabled business. Mm -hmm. You, you, anything that, that ties you even remotely into technology means you're a tech enabled business, which means our innovation hub is available to support you even if that means making connections, some sort of wraparound services to provide guidance while you're still in the infancy, while you're doing your business development, while you're nervous, while you're, while you're, you're feeling unsure and you're second guessing yourself. The only way that I think artists are going to get through that and make it to a level where the art as a business is going to potentially work is to get through that first 12 to 18 months and have the strongest plan in place to be able to go 
and take to the next level. And whatever that next level is, it doesn't mean you're going to go to MoMA. It doesn't mean that you're going to you're going to make hundred thousand dollars a year selling art. But say you're able to sell whatever it is your goal is. If you achieve those reasonable, realistic goals, you're going to feel really good. And that's where confidence is derived as an artist. It's derived from you building and creating your work and being satisfied with it. And it's derived from the affirmation that you get in the community from people who see your work and appreciate it and embrace it. And it's a balance where it feeds on itself, but there's a process involved and it's a really uncomfortable process. And I see a lot of artists that aren't willing to make that step. And um, I just want to clarify, this is called the hub or the innovation hub is the name of it? It's Cultivator is the oh, name Cultivator. of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the name of it. Yes. Okay. We don't have a, down, a location yet, but we'll, we're working on that. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, are you finished, Mark? Because I have two follow-ups sure. on that. Um, the first is the uncomfortable piece that we're kind of talking about, is that if you want to have an art business, you have to look at yourself as a business. It's unfortunate, but it's true. You need to understand finances. You need to understand what you are federally obligated to be, like filing for taxes. If you have employees, you need to understand those pieces. and it doesn't matter what you're doing in a small business you want to be doing the thing like if you're if you have a retail store or a you're a cook like you want to be doing that unfortunately if you want to run business you have to do all those other things too. so <laughs> so there's are tons of resources that can help you get there so you mentioned the small business um spdc uh they actually have an advisor they have regional advisors and then they have um, like industry focused advisors. So they have an advisor that's particularly for creatives. Um, and so she knows how creative businesses work, which is- We work with a there. ton of creative businesses. Yeah, it's Vermont, so yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but so they have all those tools to do business planning, to help you with finances. Um, they did tons of work during COVID with, with the grants and everything like that. So, and everything they offer is free. I mean, that's the other thing. Like you still have to do the work, but it's there. Um, but then knowing your limitations. So if, if doing your accounting is just like, yes, technically you could do it, but you don't want to do it. You do have to find a way to pay for it, but have someone else do it. Like if you don't want to do your online marketing, which I'm first doing now for Cultivator, and I hate it, and it takes forever. <laughs> and I would love, I have no budget for it, but like, it would be great, and it would take tons of, it would take, it would free up tons of my time to be able to put put that on someone else's shoulder. Like, just just do that if you can. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad, glad you picked that up, Abby, because that's part of something that stops me so much. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I'm just not computer-minded. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not business-minded. I'm not. I'm a creative, and I make, I make art. Mm -hmm. And I'm not asking these people who are great at bookkeeping and all that stuff to make the art. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and yet a lot of today, it's like everybody's expected to be able to do everything. You're expected to go online and figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And I can't express the, um, the frustration and how much I hate doing yeah. that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it stops me quite a bit. Yeah. 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 I will say there, like what we're saying here, and Abby, I'll sorry to jump in, but um, there are also so many tools because people hate it, <laughs> and so they're like, hey, you're not the one. Yeah. <laughs> you, there are tools where you can just allocate, you know, an hour on one day a week, and just be able to knock out like a schedule where you're able to keep a regular presence on you know, Instagram, wherever it might be, um, but not have to daily just think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and something that, so we're all in Randolph or in the central Vermont area, and at the Craft Center, something that we, I'm not making any promises, and Abby and I have also been talking about some exciting ideas, but um, I really do want to have, um, a lot of our artists have conversations that are just like this, you know? It's like, well, what are you doing for taxes? Or like, I don't know, how, how do you get a portfolio together? What website platforms do you have that's free or easy enough to use? And um, I would like to get um, a series going where we're just able to have casual conversations. Um, maybe an expert comes in and is able to kind of you know, lead a conversation or share resources. 
Um, but I think it's kind of a natural need and natural step forward with this conversation. Um, I am just as like, not that we have to go around and talk about it, but um, I am super interested in kind of what are the individual challenges that everyone faces because it is so nuanced what everyone is doing. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I just wanted to put that out there that uh, I would be like uh, with my platform at the Craft Center, I'd be happy to like ID on how to continue this conversation with different categories. I've kind of been taking note of that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and also something I wanted to mention as we've been talking about things. Um, I mean, we are a small state. I, I have found that if you just make an introduction of yourself to various entities, people are more than happy to help. Um, so I know that at the Arts Council, with any grant that comes up, you guys are so great about saying, like, reach out, be in touch if you have any questions. Um, and I haven't yet done that, but I know it's a resource and it's available. Um, yeah, and so with um, the Small Business Association, I, one of my friends who has a creative business, um, uh, he's been, you know, at, we've been talking a lot about subjects like this and kind of different struggles that we face. And um, I'm a nonprofit, he's a for profit, um, but I reached out just to be like, what resources do you have? For the state, and I learned about you're saying about there's a lot of the consultants that they just put you together, they put you with them for free, and it's just like all this wealth of resources that it's not you're in my sector, you but don't think of it as being applicable to you, but right? Yeah, yeah it's, but it was tremendous, and yeah, I just know if you start scratching at the surface, you kind of have an inkling of what your need might be or areas that you don't even want to delve into, like social media. If you start like scratching at the surface and and asking around or just reaching out to you know, people who are running different entities that kind of manage that thing, it, it can be very fruitful. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage that. Yeah. I'll mention specifically on our website, we have this area called the Knowledge Center, and um, my colleague, Dominique Gustin, who's our artist Can you services, tell us that website? Sorry. Yes. So it's the Vermont Arts Council oh. website, um, and so there's a, a section of the website called the Knowledge Center, and it's broken out into resources for artists and arts organizations, and my colleague Dominique Gustin is our artist services manager uh, and a working artist, um, and she is uh, quite diligent about updating those resources and those links for artists. So it's some of the things we've mentioned around like social media tips or financial management tips, there's some good links there. It might be a good starting point to, to start browsing. Mm -hmm. Um, another resource which um, I'm more familiar with for uh, musicians, but I, I just checked it out to confirm that there are graphic designers and artists listed on the website called Creative Grounds, oh, yeah. which is um, yeah. managed by the England Foundation for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a platform where artists and organizations that hire artists can have profiles. And if you're looking for a landscape artist, mm -hmm. um, you might Google that and find Sue. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it is uh, in in uh, the the major grant that NEPA has for hiring artists. Uh, a requirement is that that they have a profile. Um, it's meant to be like this comprehensive directory of the creative yeah. economy for all of New England. It's so, awesome. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, 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 it's so awesome. And it has a it has like a like scoring it has a scoring yeah. mechanism built in it, so it tells you how good your your, your site is, is becoming mm -hmm. and that you have, they have an objective of getting up over 20 which which means like you've built a really quality uh, site for yourself on this what and if you don't it? want to make a web page it, well exactly you your web it, it's also a precursor to establishing a web page because you can put all your links on there yeah you can you can highlight some of your current Where is work it's called creative Grounds. Grounds. org yeah yeah, it's really good. And you, yeah, so each each state arts agency is kind of like the administrator for the different yeah. state. So you can if you link if you look at our arts directory, it goes straight to Creative Ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you can put you can put up to ten different links to different works you have going. Yeah, you yeah. can do a ton of different things. It's really good. And like I said, you may not be able to identify exactly how much activity is happening on it, but it's out there. It's something that you've done. You put it out there. And what Chloe spends a great deal of time, when she comes to the board and she talks about artists that she's, she's securing for shows here, um, you know, we, are, we run a really tight ship. Our budget is almost a million dollars a year. There's always a gap uh, 
you were trying to, it's stressful to figure it all out. So she's, she's having a reaction to that trigger. Uh, so she's often come back with, oh, I got a $2,000 grant with Lipa for this artist to pay the artist. Chloe is known in the community. I don't know if you're familiar with Feast and Field. Well, it's Chloe. She's the one that was her, uh, that was hers. She, she pays the artists in, uh, that perform here really well. She respects them. She supports them. So she is an excellent contact in the community because, like I said, she, when she negotiates with the artist, she, she, she figures out creative ways to get them money. Mm -hmm. And the, the way she's, one of the ways she does that is through this creative uh, ground. Yeah. I can never remember the name it's of it. It's also a place where you can search for galleries. You know, mm -hmm. So there's institutions yeah. there, too. So exactly. It's, it's a perfect combination of people that, mm -hmm. that can help and support you and it's a community of, of artists that are in a similar position to you. Uh, I mean, so. I, I looked at it um, a number of times whenever I'm looking for new teaching artists mm -hmm. or um, yeah. potential uh, people to exhibit. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a tremendous resource. So I have one, we've been talking a lot about um, how to get art, art on digital platforms, but having a gallery downstairs um, that has some really great shows that get really good responses, um, but don't have a lot of sales. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how, um, in as a position of being a space that hosts artists, mm -hmm. how what resource there might be to get the right people to us, and um, mm -hmm. because uh, as much as people love the shows. Uh, I have a yeah, comment about that. Yeah. I think one of the issues that I get from you know, when curating some of those yeah. shows and talking to people that you know like submit and hang their yeah. work is nobody has any idea how to price their work. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like yeah. here, 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 and here all over the place. So there isn't it's kind of like a, a baseline of what you can expect when you go in to see how much things are going to cost. It's, and I, I think that's probably usual. It's just yeah. that, you know, like, if you want to have a show where you think people are going to buy a lot of work, hmm. then you, you've got to have, like, an expectation from the people who are going to view that show mm -hmm. of what they, what they can spend. I mean, yeah. once in a while, we'll sell, like, something really high end, yeah. mm -hmm. and then nothing else, right. right? One thing, or two things. But, and then sometimes we'll sell the things that are on the lower end because they're on the lower end, and that's what people at Randolph can afford. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. you know? That is socioeconomically exactly. in our blue collar community. So mm -hmm. the pricing of the art yeah. oftentimes will determine whether it sells. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because my wife works at Dartmouth, and she was very helpful to me when I was first starting to sell my work about how to price it. And oftentimes people will come up to me and say, Wow, you price your stuff really cheap. I'm like, Well, $400, $200, that sort of thing. I've got a piece over at one of the galleries now that's, it's a five by seven piece. It's like $500, you know? I, I got, the, I got the, the canvas for free. I priced in the time that I put into it on an hourly basis. And when I sell more art, I feel like then I can start raising my prices accordingly a little bit, but I give it, you know, I give myself an hourly wage when I do my work. I price it that way. I price in the costs associated with the material. And then I see what happens. And if I'm selling work, great. If I'm not, it's not an attack on my ego or, or by lowering the prices. You lower the prices and you find, you find where the market is for your work. And, um, but what I wanted to ask was, ma'am, you, you worked at Ava. You've, you've done a lot of sales at Ava. And I, you know, I'm so hard of hearing. That's uh, hard for me to Is it hard? Time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then I won't. But I can answer a question. Well, I was, I was, I was curious about pricing your work. Uh, yeah. And you, with your experience at Ava, uh, what over your multiple decades of, of, of art, how you came to price your work? Okay, um, you know, a long time ago, I decided I wanted to be a community artist. I wanted to be, you know, part of the community. I sell a lot of my own work. I'm always ready to sell. I've actually sold paintings on airplanes to the people that <laughs> <laughs> I have all kinds Marketing. of stories. Um, so my prices, I'm not in a mode of, I raise my prices, but very slowly. And I'm not trying to build a reputation like for New York or something. Um, so I, you know, I 
I do raise my prices. I'm very careful. I mean, I even wrote a book. It's Amazon Kindle, a book by John Robin, <laughs> on selling your work. Because artists can be a, so much in the way of selling their own work. So um, you've got to be very careful how you talk about your work. Um, you want this old thing? You know, like, because yeah. I did it two years ago. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I always keep my prices, you know, it's like three ninety five for my less expensive oils. And I always find a way to have a couple of those in my art show. Sure. So that I feel like people can, like I could buy one of those, you know. Yeah, <laughs> if you make a thousand widgets, you and, want to sell them. Um, but and the bigger work is much more expensive, up to $4,500. Wow. I've sold those in Vermont. Um, you have to just expect them to sell. That's, you so, know. So there's a long tail on your work that's more expensive. It may sit for several years yeah. before it sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really um, focus on, um, for example, at the uh, mud show. You know, if I'm going to enter that, <laughs> I'm going to enter a big one because it'll go over the fireplace and everybody will notice it. Um, in a group show, when you have, I mean, some of your little pieces will stand out, but not always. Um, and so either, you know, go for making a splash or, and I, often the price really doesn't matter to the buyer. Um, so I don't get into discounts and things like that. I think you've got to be really careful. People talk to each other and, um, mm. you know, it, it can be just awkward. Uh, set the price and keep the price and mm -hmm. know what your prices are. And when someone turns to me and says, oh, you know, I say I sell my work and um, this one would be $3.95. You know, you're just ready to say it, yeah. mm -hmm. and you're not. Not that it's been sitting in your oh, basement for six years. Yeah. 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 What this whole thing? Yeah. 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 Don't, yeah. don't undercut your galleries. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're doing a lot of mm -hmm. work that you maybe don't want to do, so mm -hmm. don't undercut them at your own. Mm -hmm. You know. It's all a part of that culture of like building a culture yeah. around valuing mm -hmm. artistic mm -hmm. work, and that's yeah. an important mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. But really cultivate your patrons and call the patrons yeah, yeah. and understand they're going to be your best buyer. They're yeah. coming back all the time, looking at your work, yeah. and they're the most likely buyer for the second, third, fourth painting. Yes. And um, I will get a discount to them if they're buying two at a time, or they're buying, mm -hmm. you know, two within a week or something. Yeah. But in general, they're not looking for a deal. They're just looking at my opinions, you know. That, and, um, I think that I goes that goes back to that empowering yourself <clears throat> and embracing that mm -hmm. role of running your business and mm -hmm. not that that comfort level with money. Nobody like talking about money makes us all feel icky, mm -hmm. and usually the people who, when it's not talked about, it's the people who have the least who are most negatively impacted. So I think that's also part of a cultural thing. Like we all probably have to deal with individually, but culturally, talking also, about well, all my work isn't good enough. That's the thing, right? Yeah, that's what you're There's saying. There's a lot. Yeah. My work is a baggage. No, it's fair. That person's work, so right. mine has to be cheaper for in order for somebody to mm -hmm. want to take it away. And that's a very personal thing yeah. to kind of that, that, right. get over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Oh, go ahead. Um, there's very technical ways that you could do comparisons, you know, the, the very traditional marketing uh, in, in um, you know, checking what other people are selling comparable things for, but that doesn't translate as well into creative because mm -hmm. it, you're, you're mm -hmm. putting so much work. So a good, like know your venue, I think is more like important than knowing your comps. So mm -hmm. understanding, um, if you're selling in a gallery in Woodstock, maybe you can bump your prices up and why not do that? Mm -hmm. But here you might be, you know what your baseline would be and then like fluctuate mm -hmm. from there. So yeah. mm -hmm. I think that's hard to tell a lot of different types of artists that mm -hmm. like show in a place like this. 
because there are people, like even downstairs, there's people who do a lot of work of what they do, and people that only have a few pieces what they do, and so, like I say, the price range just get all over the place, and it's hard, like, for expectations for people to come and see a show here. I think that's one of the issues why we don't sell a lot. I think that's another reason why it's important to, to, to expand out to a number of different venues to, to show your work. Like, yeah. I, I, I submitted 100 submissions last year to, uh, to, uh, to reviews. And I was on the cover of one. I was in about eight different universities. Um, I was at Carnegie Mellon. I was at the cover of New, like, like just a bunch of little places. And every one of them was an opportunity to to get to know new people. It added to my network. And you know, my my stuff is like weird shit, right? So like, I, like some of the stuff that I have here is a little more normal. Some of the stuff I sell. Yeah, like it, or I show in other places a little bit weirder, you know, and then I start seeing the fringe outsider art community kind of build. You know, I've got friends up in Montreal that are like, there's a whole outsider art scene up here that's really interesting, and like I'm just getting kind of like the real tight knit community, you know, and I'm just starting to get in on it a little bit. And, you know, this this ties into the uh, it segues really well into what a community can do to strengthen the artist in the art in, in the artist community. Mm -hmm. And organizations like what Cultivator is becoming, organizations like what you're doing, Jess, what Vermont Arts Council is doing. Vermont Arts Council has every year you're you're giving out millions of dollars in support to communities, to center cultural centers like like, like Chandler, to individual artists. Um, so there's there's always resources available, but it brings us down to the thing where you have to actually reach out and be part of a community to get to know what's there. Mm -hmm. And like art, like things that what we're doing is so unique that it's always shifting and evolving. One of the things that we we've, we've had a challenge with at Chandler uh, is before the before COVID hit, we had we had a vision and a strategy of where we were going, and then now. Whoa, whoa, that's not it anymore. And we're still trying to figure it out. You know, our seat sales are 60% of what they were or less prior to the pandemic. We're, we're trying to, to re-identify, re reshape ourselves. And I think a number of the cultural institutions in the state are trying to figure out that. And if the cultural institutions are in that quagmire, the individual artists have to be in a similar place, trying to figure out where you are in this digital world. What what is digital art now? What is AI? What sort of influence is it having? You go online and you see art. It is so big and so intense and so, like all of your senses are getting stimulated with some of this work, right? Like sometimes when I go on, I go on social media or I go and I see some of this digital work, it makes me angry. Mm -hmm. Like how can somebody see what I'm doing as interesting after they've been so utterly stimulated online? Mm -hmm. But this brings us back to the community, it brings us back to the community supporting each other. It brings us back to having a smaller base to build off of, to sell your work, to get that affirmation that you need. It's not going to be as big as we perceived it to be um, in, in years past. I've kind of heard that before with respect even to farms. It's the story that sells it. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, I knew this couple when they started. Oh, we visit their ducks every spring and their baby, their baby sheep and all the rest of it. Like it's. There's very much a connection and a story, and I think you can, it, and I say story almost as in the sense of like a movie or a narrative or a, a novel, mm -hmm. but like it does seem like there's a lot of human connection in a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's yeah. some found mm -hmm. online, but it's often, you know, as a referral or a referral from a Facebook group or a referral from a friend or you know they really all of a sudden tapped in blueberry cellophane bee and there's one painting on the whole internet <laughs> of a blueberry cellophane bee and that was their research thesis mm -hmm. so like i mean it's it's very there's this tight-knit connections even online yeah mm -hmm. oh i was gonna follow up on that with like that ties into sort of the um the online presence, like you, you literally have to brand yourself. And I'm hearing there's like a lot of burnout with those artists that are like super online, posting every day, doing videos, doing TikToks, doing, you know, every single social media channel, they have to become like a marketing expert. And that's part of it as a story because you have to be 
a brand as well as sell your artwork. It's like two mm-hmm. jobs. And a producer. Yeah. 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 Which is like, it's just the nature of, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. of yeah. how it works now. now you know? If I can piggyback on that, just mm-hmm. to say, there, there needs to be the opposite of it. There needs to be, yeah. you need to divorce yourself from it for a while. And uh, last summer I did a two week um, art residency, uh, which was off grid and it was, it, it was incredible, except it ended with the flood. Oh. So <laughs> that was bad because I was completely disconnected from my my family for a little bit while I was worried about a, a river raging through my house, which it wasn't doing, luckily. But um, that so there was a bittersweet ending to it. But for two weeks, I wasn't on a phone, I wasn't looking at the news cycle, and I was making art every day. And I so I, I would urge everybody to pull back from that business part that you need to do. You do need to do it, but also go back to your core of like why you make art anyway. Set those boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Find, yeah. find a time to sequester yourself with your practice enough that you're not distracted by all that stuff because it, that can be vital. Um, and in making you making it so that when you get back to the spreadsheet, you're like, okay. Going back to your Venn diagram um, yeah. analogy. Yeah. Is, is, it's definitely an uh, important aspect of branding and, and finding like the root of what you do and defining what success means to you, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this takes some detachment to do that, but then also reattachment. You kind of have to constantly rebrand yourself a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I also come back to the point of community and um, developing that vocabulary for yourself mm-hmm. really has a lot to do with who you talk to and what the ideas that they have for you and your problems perhaps or what you bring to the table and really as far as not being really tech savvy and not like computers and all, you don't necessarily have to but you have to know what you want out of it I feel like um, the results and the success that you're looking for and as soon as you bring that you know a little education a little research with Google but um, ask it what you need and you can find the help in the community um, just there's people that are experts in the digital realm and mm-hmm. to be excited for your problem. So mm-hmm. um, kind of just that Venn diagram, yeah. multiple Venn diagrams most of yeah, the time for business many. development, but <laughs> you know. Yeah, maybe in the end your Venn diagrams be like a piece of abstract art, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. totally. Is there a chat forum like for Vermont artists going, how the heck do I there's quite a lot of active Facebook groups, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I'm aware of. One's called Artists of Vermont, um, the Vermont Creative Network, which is an initiative that we run at the Arts Council in collaboration with lots of different Those artists awesome. and sectors. It's called the Vermont Creative Network. Um, so we have a, a, a Facebook page, but more importantly, we've, we've kind of broken up the state into zones, and we really focus on networking and research and advocacy as well. But there's, um, so so here in this area, Megan Asbury from the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Planning Commission is the zone agent and she'll convene different networking things from, from time to time. Mm-hmm. That's in real life, Another IRL, not in chat. <laughs> exactly. I can put you in touch with that. Megan actually. She's a, <laughs> she's a great resource. Okay. Um, and we're co-hosting the network with them. I can plug now or later. Um, <laughs> um, it's, so we're doing, um, it's Artistry Meets Innovation. Uh, if anyone's aware, there's an amazing um, advanced manufacturing lab up on BTC's campus. It's insane. Um, and we're doing an open house and tooling it towards what, for, for creative producers. And um, it may or may not be useful for, for what, you do, but just going through it, you'll be inspired. Um, and so we're going to meet, we'll meet Barry, who's the director, and then do tours through the, um, the advanced manufacturing labs up there. So when is it? When is it? it's, uh, it's April 29th. We have not determined time yet, but if you also sign up for Cultivator's newsletter, you will also get that. <laughs> There's another um, networking organization in the state for women, Vermont Womenpreneurs, Um, and that was a place that I started last spring, and and Abby brought them here to Wit and Grit um, for a meetup. When was that? It was like a month ago. It was in January. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. And we're having another one of those yeah. in um, in May, May sixth. In Red yeah. can we get on that list? Or can I not say? You have to email us, right? Cultivator. Yeah. 
It's Vermont Womenpreneurs, so it's like entrepreneurs starts with okay. women. <laughs> Womenpreneurs, and um, just go onto their website and sign up for their newsletters, and you'll get information about all the meetups they have around the state, which are regular. But it's great when you can have one that's right here at Whitman Bread or elsewhere. What is the good name? Yeah, Whitman Bread. Yeah. Whitman Bread is a great spot. Right around the list, does everybody put their emails on it? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. people prefer that instead of going to. We can website. actually follow up with everyone yeah. with an e your email from yeah. tonight as well. Mm -hmm. That would yeah, be. I was just about to suggest if yeah. one of you could compile a list yes. of all these wonderful yeah. things. Yeah. things. I what write down them? things all. That looks like my notepad. Yeah. 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 I have a question that I was going to ask before. The other thing that I said was, you seem to be able to find things to submit work to that are all over the place. Do you, is there some kind of like national or state list of things to sub, uh, submit all queries? Yeah, I, I, use, uh, I use Submittable uh, as my primary source for, uh, for submissions for, uh, for literary reviews, for visual art, for residencies, for ex exhibitions, and uh, it gets, it's a fantastic site. You can uh, once you've once you've done a hundred like like I have. It's easy to send these. You can do a submission while you're cooking dinner one night because you have all your stuff in order. You know what to sort of throw in, um, and you, it also gives you an opportunity to kind of learn. Like, I get rejections on Fridays. So sort of like my wife and I have jokes. Where it's like, oh, it's Friday. It's rejection day. You know? I'm like, I got four. I got four rejections today. But every once in a while, I get accepted. And we get accepted. We have a little celebration. And you know, we we all. I keep I keep my reviews in the in the bathroom sometimes. So if, you want, if you want it, <laughs> it's silly. Is that yeah, I would put it in other places. But uh, but yeah, submittable is really good. And they say that the success rate for people that actively use it is about 2%. So it's very low, um, but it's worth doing because you get your work out there. Uh, some, every once in a while, you get really good responses from people like, we could not use your weird shit, but boy, we loved it. <laughs> and you know, this is what we liked about it, and we wanna, we wanna sh maybe we wanna put you in touch with this other person, and maybe you can do this. And I've, yeah, I've had a few cases where um, it's been it's been really a fun process, even being rejected. So submittable, that's I think the most successful one out there. Hmm. This goes back to your question about um, whether to post to Instagram or not, and is it worth it? Just have a presence there, even if it's not, even if you're not getting tons of engagement, because if you have a piece in a show here, for instance, or you do something through submittable and end up on a cover somewhere, people will look you up. And they, they want to see a little more about you, and then that's sort of becomes a place where they can see mm -hmm. a little more. And it's a landing pit place where yeah. the data can yeah. yeah. to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, when I see something yeah. by an artist and I go look for them on Instagram and I don't find them there, I'm like, what the heck? They're not yeah. like, what? <laughs> what that, they that's here? a really interesting yeah. point. There's a, there's it's, a, it's a pretty low lift. Yeah. 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 Some Just there's, have it there. Yeah, yeah. There's, a site, there's a site called Solo TO. And that's like an opportunity for you just list links to different pieces of work. Yeah. And uh, that's what I started before I made a website. Mm -hmm. And I put, I put just a list of, of where I had exhibits. I put a list of, I write music, so I, I put a link to, to all the music that I've written on SoundCloud and made connections. I made a little video. So I, and I keep my solo TO open. Right there, Mark, you're going. I can ask. Do you, have a, do you have a website? You can put your link there, or do you have a do you have something? You can put your social media link. So you could you start throwing in a little bit more, and you're filling out because everybody that's looking at your work and checking it, they all have a different style of making a determination if they want to work with you or buy your work. So if you offer a number of different ways, some people are more visual; they want to actually look at a picture of your work. Some people want to see a video, and so if you have some video stuff, you can they'll look at that. You know, some people want to they're just there's just weird people out there, and the people that look at your work are usually really weird. And so, <laughs> and, you know, they're artists. They're weird. And, you know, you, you you know, you never know what the what's going to hook them in. So the more you create yourself, the more well-rounded you are. Just like a business, if if you're able to kind of present yourself in a real well-rounded, holistic way. I know that's a word that's kind of overused, but you, your work is more likely to be seen. And 
I am by no means a professional artist. I am an emerging artist, and but I have a lot of energy and drive and, I, and support from our community. And I think that what you'll find in Randolph is we really do have an enormously uh, supportive community for the arts. And it's really, it's really just a budding thing that's happening. We've always had creative artists in our community, but it's becoming something more. And this is why, this is why having you folks here tonight is so important to me mm -hmm. from an economic development standpoint, but also as an artist. Like having Amy here tonight from Vermont Arts Council is a real privilege. Mm -hmm. She, the, the Vermont Arts Council does enormous support for, for the artistic community. She has resources, she knows people, and you know, we're just so, we're so happy to have you here. Yes. Thrilled to be invited, and um, if I can just say briefly a little bit more about grants that we Please. offer. So we're the State Arts Agency, there's one of us in every single state, uh, and the way it works is that the National Endowment for the Arts gives each state some money, the state has to match that money, and it's our job to invest those resources to support the artistic community in all different ways throughout the state. So we're investing in arts organizations, in arts education, in community art projects, and in individual artists. Not every state arts agency is able or willing to give money directly to artists. We have the privilege of being able to do that. Um, grants can play an important role in how you're thinking about your career. Um, and I want to um, also just kind of, the caveat there is that they're extraordinarily competitive and we are thrilled that we've been able to quadruple the amount of money that we have available to individual artists. Um, so we're giving out a lot more grants. We're giving out slightly bigger grants, although I wish they could be bigger. The fact remains that our funding rate is about 10 to 14% for individual artist grants. So I don't say that like, I, I feel weird saying like it's very competitive. Like we wish that wasn't the case. I think it's a result of just like the unbelievable cultural creative talent that there is in this state. And I also think it's important to say just in terms of like managing people's expectations, but we do have two primary grants for artists. And I brought a handout that's called Resources for Artists. They're on the wrong table at the exit. Okay. Yes. So, and this, this handout kind of breaks out the particular grant programs and then the other kinds of resources that we have available, including that Vermont Creative Network that I was mentioning a little while ago. So the two primary artistic uh, grants for individual artists are the Creation Grant Program, which is open now, which is uh, up to $5,000 for the creation of new work. Um, and then the smaller grant that operates twice a year is called the Artist Development Grant. And so that's up to 2,000, and that's for, um, hey, I need a, a website developer, or I need marketing assistance, or I have this opportunity to uh, we just supported someone who's uh, going to a really important national conference to speak in their field, poetry, um, and they couldn't otherwise go and be a part of that. So that's, um, so I just want to mention those two resources. Grants can be a real pain. We try to simplify the process and remove the barriers. Um, we're really happy to talk to people and like help them through the process. Um, and you just have to kind of figure out whether it's all grants, not just us, are, are worth your time because there, there is some amount of work and it is no guarantee, but it can be a useful part of kind of your income stream. Mm -hmm. So who are you Writing looking for? Can you that 10% you're looking for. <laughs> well, because like you said, we don't want to take the time yeah. of day. <laughs> so you, you're, you just can't afford it. <laughs> right, yeah, no, you've got to make that, that decision whether you want to go into that grant making uh, realm because you are having to take time to really articulate like what your mission is and, and what you're doing. Um, the way our grants work, because we're giving away government money, there is some accountability there. And so the way we operate, most state arts agencies operate, uh, we're not making this decision. So we're not sitting with a an idea of, um, we want abstract, we want weird, we want Mark's weird shit. <laughs> we, uh, we are, all of our grants are discipline agnostic. So uh, all, all disciplines, so you know, you're in the mix with musicians and sculptors and theater folks, uh, and we employ an external panel process. So uh, we're, we put, put, put out the guidelines for applicants so you can see really clearly, it's kind of like being a teacher. 
here's the rubric that you're going to be graded on. Here's the things we're looking for. Try to be really clear with the applicants uh, in advance. Here's what we're looking for. And then we pull in panelists from all over and often work with individual artists. If you're interested in serving as a panelist, it's a real, did you do it just now? Did you do it recently? No. Okay. I, I, can we figure out the work? No. What? Okay. Well, we <laughs> anyway, um, so we're recruiting from the community, always looking for a broad diversity of perspectives, different disciplines, different kind of points of view. Um, and uh, they kind of go through and read the applications. Points for unique, by the mm -hmm. way. That you just said, points for unique, potentially. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, each grant program has the kind of breakout of the criteria, yeah. okay. um, and so that's what, that's how the panelists are kind of I just went through decisions. decisions. I yeah. went through a couple years of applying for some particular grants, and what they really wanted was street theater. So oh. unless you were doing street theater, oh like my gosh. a production where there's tickets or gen absolute admission, they don't see that as affecting larger amounts of community, even if you sell lots of calendars and educational material, for example, on college and videos and things like that. Oh, yeah. So it's just very feels like a waste narrow. of your time when yeah, they already yeah, have a preconceived yeah. idea of what they're funding. Yeah. yeah, even though you're like people are getting like books with illustrations and text, it's not considered ex um what do they call it? Like Street presence or performance of oh, the kind yeah. of exposure. I don't know. You know, they want a grant. They want. To, they want to get the biggest impact as possible, and they measure impact by like performance attendance, essentially, oh, or yeah. like how many people are passing on the street that day, or how many people will go to the well, show. Right for you. How, yeah. So like the way they scale it is. I think that's a Not really important point to do everything you can from yeah. the beginning to find out what yeah. the great tour yeah. is looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, we try to be as transparent as possible. Sure. Here's, here's how we're assessing it and we welcome those conversations mm -hmm. with yeah. us mm -hmm. beforehand. Um, but yeah, that sounds really frustrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can speak for Vermont Arts Council. If there are people you can actually call for clarification on the application process, you could actually, if you're uncomfortable writing, you can do video. You can do video submissions. You can do yeah. video submissions. Okay. So there's there are a number of opportunities to kind of and now and I know this sounds probably uh, a little strange, but with AI, with the proper prompting, you can get assistance on the way that you're applying, and you don't have to be ashamed of it. It's not like you're you're letting AI write your application, but you're using if you're using proper prompts and asking correctly. It's really worth your time to learn about what AI can offer. It, the people over the next 24 months that embrace AI for, the, for, for using it properly are gonna have a very distinct advantage, advantage over those that aren't. And it allows you to be able to apply for something like a grant at Vermont Arts Council by not making it less worthy, but actually making it better because yeah. it's it very succinct. You, you you ask AI what what the objectives are, what the clarification, what the needs are for the for the actual grant. You talk about all your skills, and you can have AI actually tie in those to help you write perhaps an essay on why this grant is important to you, and then you can take that and use that as a starting point to turn it into something that's a little bit more your own. <laughs> and my wife works at Dartmouth. Dartmouth is an Ivy League school. There are, there are some of the smartest people around, and they have spent probably, she spent probably a third of her time over the last year learning how design instructors are using AI to help teach. Okay? So this is, this is the real deal. It's not all evil. It's not all something that's that's dangerous and bad. If you actually, if you actually avail yourself of what it is and use it in an area that's helpful for you, you'll find that it can it can simplify your life a great deal. I will say, uh, Katrina has been teaching classes on how to use it. And mm -hmm. we're not sure so, no, really? so the next ones that I have are actually image creation, but mm -hmm. if I get enough interest, I'll do the language one again. So it's teaching ChatGPT how to use it to do what you're doing better, you know, run your business, write your business and plan, and, and do it ethically. Yes, we have a nice discussion about ethics as well. Um, and the whole, I mean, going back to the, the topic of 
the story or whatever it is that makes the art interesting, mm -hmm. I think what's going to happen as we're flooded with this AI imagery mm -hmm. is it's going to be the tactileness of yeah. things that are actually created by hand, and that's what's mm -hmm. going to get people interested. More and more value. 100%. Right, mm -hmm. right. So yeah, showing that in your social media, I think, is going to be important, mm -hmm. whether that's video or with the story or maybe showing the piece as it goes through mm -hmm. the the creation phases. I think it's going to make a big difference. That's really good. That's been a huge discussion in the licensing industry, mm -hmm. just oh. because for the wall decor side, we obviously use like AI as a tool, like for writing blog posts or um, coming up with concept ideas or just um, you know, generative film and Photoshop or Firefly, there's all kinds of uses for it. But um, unfortunately, what, what we've been seeing is like customers who um, will use like Midjourney to create 100% AI wall decor and, um, you know, sell that wholesale, which um, it's a total change from the way things used to be. It's happened very fast. And there's no laws to protect artists whose mm -hmm. art has been used for those learning models. Um, so, so uh, you know, part of the reason I'm here is I feel like my job isn't going to be around for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to have to do that pivot to, um, you know, figuring out an alternative. I do think real art is going to become a luxury good as we see, like, this glut of like disgusting looking, like digital weird art, like hit the market. I think customers will we'll be able to tell the difference soon mm -hmm. and we'll look for real yeah. tactile art. Yeah, I love yeah. geometric art, mm -hmm. but now when I see geometric art, that's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if like, I, I, I question whether it's digital or whether it's, 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 yeah. it's human made. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, that's what I do. When I do my art, when I do geometric work, I purposefully make sure that there's like, it does not look like, like the lines aren't perfect. It's not as tight as what I would want it to be mm -hmm. maybe a few years ago. Uh, because I'm, I am, I feel like it's going to fall into a category where it's just that was digitally created, mm -hmm. and I do. I think the little nuances, the the what could be perceived as mistakes or the or a weakness mm -hmm. years ago is now going to be a. It pays uh, to be messy. Yeah, yes. it's going to it's going to be a distinct advantage. Mm -hmm. Again, during the next twenty four months, it is an opportunity. I was a trader on Wall Street for 20 years, and every time there was disorder and chaos in the markets, it was an opportunity to make a shitload of money. <laughs> and this is where we are as artists right now. There's, there's a lot of chaos in the market. There's a lot of fear. Nobody really knows how it's going to kind of sugar out. So figuring out a way to sort of come up with a, with a place within this, this disorder and chaos right now can be very valuable for not only for us individually, but for us as a community where we can come out of this as a place where we can be a hub for artists. We can be a place where you know people want to learn and talk about experience and stuff. That can be our community. And so we are, this is a very special time, even though it doesn't necessarily seem like it is. Mm -hmm. Can I mention something we haven't talked about yet? And I'm curious how many folks are, you, you mentioned teaching a class at, at artistry. And, and as you look at the diversified income streams that a lot of artists have, often being a teaching artist or leading workshops and that sort of thing is a, is a really important piece of that. So I'm curious, I know you mentioned you're an art teacher. I'm an art teacher for preschoolers. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> that whole realm of being a teaching artist, whether you're um, you know, a, a, an employee within an organization or you're you know, doing gig works, you're doing residencies at different places, I think there's um, a lot of rich opportunities in the state for that. Um, we have a, um, uh, what do you call it? The idea exchange for teaching artists, kind of a, a networking, um, regular meeting for teaching artists. We have a teaching artist roster. There's other, many arts organizations have rosters of teaching artists who they're using for various different things, whether it's teaching classes for adults or doing a residency in a classroom. Um, so just kind of lifting that up because that hasn't really been mentioned. Yeah, that's excellent. I think we're, we, we have about 20 minutes left. So one of the, I had four topics in mind of of, uh, but we've kind of, it's funny because we've sort of gone through all of the topics organically, um, but one that we've just touched on is the mental health of, of artists um, and what resources avail are available for 
for artists to be able to pull out of their lulls, to be able to have support to, uh, it, I think it's very easy. There, there were a few of you who were talking about being uh, sort of, uh, you know, very introspective at home, sort of a reclusive, maybe a little bit. Um, and I think artists, especially when, like at times when you're really in the zone and you're working, you can be very reclusive. It could be like, I think creating art can be a very selfish endeavor where if you're really in a zone and you're working on a project, like you just disconnect with everybody. And then when you come out of it, you gotta like realize, you gotta sort of reconnect with your family and your friends and, uh, or conversely, if you're having a really hard time and you're struggling, you know, there's a whole slew of opportunities for artists to feel like they're struggling. So I'd love it if any of the panel members could talk a little bit about what, if any, programs are available for uh, for artists to be able to tap into to to reset, to get that sort of vulnerable conversation. You're talking about residency. residency. Yeah, residency. yeah, I, I think residency is the best thing. And there's so many of them once, once you start tapping in. And that's a place where in your Instagram feed, if you start Find, looking for some and following them, then you're finding like a million get thrown at you and every third picture that pops up says, apply for a residency in France. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it cost? And yeah, they're, they're all over the place in, in costs. So yes. yeah, I mean, the, the France one is like $5,000. So <laughs> <laughs> but um, there are tons of them, especially around the Northeast, like ones that are drivable, so you don't have to get on an airplane to go. There's lots of them in Maine, there's lots of them in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, you can just start snooping around the interwebs and you will find them. Where did and you do your I did mine at Sable, um, which is in Stockbridge, Vermont, and it's a, a very rustic one. It's called Sable? Sable. It's called the Sable Project, and it is, um, it's on a mountain without cell service and internet, and it was pretty magical. It is a camping residency, so you have to prepare yourself for rustic living. But um, it's great. They feed you beautifully, and um, it's super rustic, and I lived in a tent where it rained every day, and I survived. And That's a common application to the Artist yeah. Development Grant Program, is helping so, folks fund residents. I, I painted a plein air under an umbrella a couple different days, awesome. and then just out of my little hut through the window. Because I, I wanted to do plenty of painting all the time, but the, the skies weren't allowing it. <laughs> but it still was a really, really great time. Plus, it was a lot of interaction with other people that were there. They're, they do uh, their residencies are for all kinds of disciplines. So there was a, a singer songwriter. There was um, a two dancers were part of it, and they had a state an outdoor stage there. So while I was in my little space with the rain pouring down and hitting my tin roof, I was looking down out of my window to mm -hmm. dancers on stage mm -hmm. through rain. It was really great. Mm -hmm. yeah. On Submittable, you could you could apply to a hundred different residencies. residencies. While like, you're cooking dinner. Well, 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 <laughs> uh, it's funny, <laughs> with, with my job I, that I have now, part of my negotiation was that I could take up to four weeks off a year without pay for residency. Um, so I didn't have to sacrifice my relationship with my family, with vacations and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. if one comes up that Mm -hmm. uh, that I that I get accepted to, I mm -hmm. feel like I can. I've made uh, like a mental plan to be able mm -hmm. to do it and to take the time. Mm -hmm. But I also think realistically, not everyone has an opportunity to go on residencies, and so this right. is where you know mm -hmm. we are. Our family is a huge believer in therapy. <laughs> we have we all. I have five kids, their wife. Like we all have therapists, <laughs> and we uh, you know we constantly do check-ins and reality checks uh, just because the stress of life is so is so crazy we live in such a divisive society um and you know the all the emotions that come with putting yourself out there as an artist mm -hmm. it's 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 just always helpful to be able to check in and and communicate with somebody that will listen mm -hmm. the vermont studio center also in, in johnson yeah, vermont uh, that they do a um, vermont week are they doing more than one now yeah, they just, once, no, they, I thought it was once a year. I think it's once a year, but they, yeah, they just did their first one and they stopped doing it for a while. I did it about 10 years ago and it is. I think they're doing one in May. I highly recommend it. Yeah. The Vermont Studio Center is a is an internationally known residency program for artists of all disciplines and it's in Johnson, Vermont. 
um, and they hold a special residency week for Vermont. Which is very affordable. Very affordable, yeah. and they feed you beautiful yeah. food. Yes, they do. <laughs> And it's a great, but you do have to get your campus. application in there because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's competitive. It's not very competitive. Yeah. They take writers. There's so many writers awesome artists in Vermont. Uh, writers and artists, both. Yeah. I have a question for you, Amy. Um, I've noticed that on a national level, Ren, uh, not Randolph, but Vermont artists do tend to struggle more in terms of their average earnings on an annual basis than other states. Um, you know, we were much lower. Um, do you What's your data on that? I don't No, 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 I think it's, I think it's a, we've done a lot of research and I think it's a really important question. We're actually working with um, University of Vermont Center on Rural Entrepreneurship to do a new set of research and trying to get at that income piece because some of the studies, so Yes, artists in Vermont need to be making more money. Like, I believe that 1,000%. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of the data um, is a reflection of folks with side gigs. Look, like, it's not. Uh, and yep. so, if you say the average Vermont artist makes 11,000 a year, yep. then um, that leads one to think that we've got, like, truly an epidemic of starving artists in Vermont. And I don't think it's any more true than in other places. Okay, so, so the, the data is not accurate. The data sets are really hard to measure they because are. we, mm -hmm. like the agricultural sector, work in gigs and we piece We're it together here. doing yeah. a lot of other things. So it's hard to get, you, but your bigger point that my artists need to be making more money is an important piece. It's an important point, but it's good yeah. to know that. Yeah, because the numbers seem so lopsided that we're yeah. at 11 or 12,000, the national average is 25,000. <laughs> We've got such a supportive community. Why the hell are we well, making half of what other people? Population places? and logistics. I mean, we're so spread out mm -hmm. in a lot of rural areas. It's not like there's a lot of venues. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but to show your art and to be and to be active in showing it, mm -hmm. using it. I mean, unless you go to all the craft fairs, and not all artists are equipped to do that because it's financially not that easy to do and. Also, you have to have a huge body of things to take at one time, but uh, I think it's it's because there's you know like you could probably have a two or three page list of all the galleries that actually sell work in the state. It's I think that's part of it. We also have an enormous asset as a very very rural state, as you say, and yet we're sandwiched between three of the biggest arts markets there are. You know, that access to, I mean, I talked to my colleagues who are working and supporting artists in the middle of Wyoming. Um, you know, the idea of them going to Boston for anything or New York City. So I, I think that, um, I'm agreeing with your point and then just adding that we do have some advantages over some other far more isolated rural places. Well, that's true. Um, and, you know, having Montreal and New York City and Boston, there's a number of artists and maybe some of you who's, you know, they aren't selling to Vermonters. We also, yeah, we are a tourist industry as well. And yeah, the idea that artists should price their items based on Randolph's, exactly. I don't know, is not yeah. what we should be thinking. We should right. be thinking how do we market Randolph as a destination for our culinary and our arts. Mm. Our um, new website is gorgeous. Yeah. I look at it and it's like, oh my god, I live here. here. <laughs> so if you're not, if you don't know, we have a new website in uh, Randolph. It's called The Vibe. And oh, The Vibe has, uh, yes, it's a project that um, was born during the pandemic. Um, but it's now live. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a very artistic feel to it. We actually developed the website based yeah. off of, uh, we stole some of the, the design from a bunch of different galleries that we thought interesting the way they present their work. So we created our Vibe website with it to appeal to senses. Randolph5.com. Yep, Randolph5.com. We also have blogs. Um, we've, we've found funding to support our website, uh, to, to support blog writing. Um, we, it's really exciting and, and it's just begun. So there's a lot of opportunities to build out, uh, especially for the arts. Um, and so if you haven't seen it yet, it's definitely worth checking out. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a calendar on there and you can submit your account, your, you can submit things on the calendar. You go to the, you go to the 
that portion of the website. It'll come to me directly, and we can post it for you. If you can. Time back to location. <laughs> Randolph is in that very unique central Vermont location, and potentially could even. I mean, have you thought of posting directories to Vermont artists? Our, we have yeah we could do yeah. that we have we have tags and different sections on our directory and we have an artist directory so you could you could put your you could put your information on our on our business directory and tag art and you'll when someone goes and looks for art they can see they'll go right to you and your work uh, mm -hmm. with others and it's really just begun so that's and the, the business directory on the vibe is really exciting because you have an opportunity to put all your social media links on there have a little blurb about yourself so it's not just a boring directory you go in, it's very interactive. You can, you, can, you can push a button, it'll send you an email directly. You can push a call, it'll bring up the phone number. If you're using your cell phone, you can just click the number and you're, you'll connect to the, to the, to the person that's, that's, you know, that you're trying to reach out to. So it's very, uh, it's interactive. The ease of use was really important for us, uh, for the website, so people can navigate around. The average person spends almost three and a half minutes on our website when they go. And we, we, we just opened in November. We've had over 10,000 people uh, go to our site. Yeah. And, and the most popular ones, of course, are dining uh, and play, but also the arts. Mm -hmm. And Chandler has a big presence on, on the arts page because they are, you know, we have, we've had a huge digital void in central Vermont for a long time, and Randolph is starting to fill that mm -hmm. void. Mm -hmm. And over time, the, the vibe will be able to be similar to what Rutland has, which is, they, they have uh, uh, you know, other towns around Rutland actually are part of their website that have links and stuff. And I, I see Randolph playing that role with our surrounding community, mm -hmm. communities as well. So it's, it's definitely a resource. Mm -hmm. Speaking of calendars, I just wanted to mention really briefly, we have a free arts calendar. So not only can you submit any events or gallery shows, but it's also a really great place to look for things happening around the state. We also have a free arts classifieds and a lot of galleries put their calls to artists yeah. on that classifieds. You can submit anything. I saw an artist recently was giving away some of their uh, empty supplies. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of an open classified. There's job postings there. There's calls to artists there. You can swap equipment and find stuff there, too. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just on your website? Yes, and it's in. <laughs> one of these bullets here. One of, oh, yeah, here. Well, I'll give a plug. We have an, our our local artist show is an open call, um, just posted on the website, and the theme is Nature's Palette. Mm -hmm. So, we do a lot with that. <laughs> yeah. And the Craft Center is always looking for artists to get involved and also to exhibit. So, it's so funny. The last, the, this one here is the the one that's downstairs is. Uh, it involves textile stuff, and so again, my stuff is really strange and weird. So I created a eight, a four foot by ninety six inch piece with three thousand dog tags, uh, and, and all this weird stuff. And finally, the woman who was curating it said, "You know, what if I could actually be able to put this in here? Because there's there's no fabric, there's no textile, there's no nothing." I was like, "Okay, that's fine." And uh, so, you know, another one of those rejections for me, but I feel, I'm really happy about the work. I'm, I'm going to put it somewhere else. And um, so, it's part of it. It is. That's right. I'm really proud of it. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to showing it in the future. Um, but, you know, the right time, the right place. And, uh, Humane Society. <laughs> yeah. And my wife keeps saying, you just send it to some veterinary somewhere. Mm -hmm. and they'll, be, they'll, have, they'll be happy to have it there forever. But, does anyone have any other questions for the panelists before we kind of wrap up? Um, Were we going to pass around? Did we pass yeah. around uh, something for people to pass you? Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Cool. Thank you. This is to sign up for our newsletter, unless we don't want that. And yes. You can just put a note on that, and I'll share it with. Sign up for all of our newsletters. <laughs> <laughs> it's here. Okay. And I apologize because I came in late, but I didn't meet the panel. I don't know who is here. We are. Yeah. So, so Abby is. I'll just. I'll go through it real quick. I think yeah. Abby is the. Uh, she's the program coordinator for Cultivator, which is Randolph's innovation hub. Mm -hmm. Sue is a an active uh, artist mm -hmm. who's made the leap to working professionally. Uh, she has a fantastic website. She works. 
Uh, she does a great deal. Of, you know, she's out there. She's doing it. And she's she's living the dream. And, and Amy is uh, Amy is the president of the United States. Um, she's she's uh, she's with Vermont Arts Council. She's a deputy. What are you? What's yeah, deputy director. Deputy director. And and you know you know these two. So I think that's. Uh, Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you a little more about your experience with AI, and uh, because I've, I've begun using it a little bit more. I do a lot of letters of support for the business community. Mm -hmm. I had one happen last week where I had a very intense meeting with a, uh, with a feeder operation in our town. The feeder operator had uh, such a noble, uh, highbrow idea of what you do for his business over five years, but it was just not profitable. We did a, we did a SWOT analysis of, of the business. We did a million different things. I've got pages of stuff from the work that we did. And, but he's so close to actually making a, being successful. He reached out to me for a letter of support recently. And I took the pages that I had done and the work that I had done in the research of his business. I put it into an AI and I took, I took the data on the, on the grant website of the what the deliverables were and all that, and I asked them to to write uh, a letter of support for the for the feeder, and it was absolutely amazing uh, what I was able to work with at the end. And when I sent it over, I felt confident that in the past a letter of support like that would have taken me three or four hours, and this one took me about an hour and a half, two hours of savings. I could focus my time on something else. And the end result was, I always felt like my, my letters of support were maybe a B plus. This was an A plus plus. I was so proud of it. And, um, and so you yeah, really don't be, don't, don't be too, too hesitant. The to big experience. thing that I'm finding the big pushback besides the whole ethics, which is a whole other conversation, is just people say, well, I asked it something once and it turned out absolute garbage. And the big thing is it's garbage in, garbage out. 100%. How much detail you give it, the information you give it, it can get as specific as you need. It, you can dial it after it's given you something, ask for more, ask for a different tone, ask for whatever you need. After. Absolutely. Yeah. And, okay. and they all have a different way of, 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 of going out into the internet and actually helping you. Like for instance, Microsoft's uh, our AI is actually current. And so, like, if you want information that's current over the last couple of years, you want to use Microsoft, ChatGBT, and these other ones only have data that goes up to 2021. So, like, it's it, and that's a huge difference mm -hmm. among them. So, having somebody and understanding it's January 2022 now for the free version. If you use the paid version, then you're getting all the way and all the way up to now. So there's there's different nuances right? for each one. So yeah. again, it's garbage in, garbage out. The more you test and experiment, the more helpful it can be with whatever it is that you're you're looking for. And then at the end of the day, if you decide it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. It's right. um, you know, you love writing, you love longhand, you love doing all that. But at the end of the day, if it's about saving time, it's about getting through an application for a grant that's too overwhelming. Um, whereas you're able to do something that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do, then that is a win yeah. for the well, artist. Even just organizing yourself, if you've got you know yeah. ten different things that you know stuff's written on napkins, stuff from emails, you can throw it in. You can ask it what the steps are to get something done, so it can yep. organize. The, the the word that they use is prompts, right? The, right. the prompts that you put in are, are what what helps you. But anyways, it is after eight, so thank you to all the panel members yes. for. Uh, for to you all for being here and I hope we're able to connect again in the future and remember Randolph is here and it's only going to get better over the coming years so we're hoping that we'll see more of you in the future. Thanks, Thanks for all the work you all do. Yeah.